your people tried, your student union colleagues really tried very hard. And when it didn't work out, I said, look, it's very unfair on you that you're being made to stand there. So why don't I give you the gist of my lecture? So I sat them down at the gate. I gave them 15 minute summary capsule of my speech. And then I came and my apologies that you had to do that. <laughs> when I heard the two speakers before me, I was very happy and I was very annoyed. I was very happy because of what I heard. Uh, I, I know Pradit, but I don't know you, my young friend. Abit. Abit. Uh, your speech was wonderful. <laughs> Great. But you stole all the things that I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my complaint against both of you. Uh, what I can do is to try and link the two. I think that linkage is very critical. Sadly, in the country today, among the liberals, among those who are progressive, among those who are willing to take a broader view are seen to be, what should I say, urban nutshells? <laughs> among them, there is a slight crack, a division. Most of them would say, see the point that the first speaker made as very, very legitimate points. But many of them would not see the point that Pradyut made as very legitimate points. Yes. I'm sure many of you would also have those questions in mind. And I wanted to touch upon that and to see, to say why what both of them said are actually very legitimate positions. And these are reconciliable positions. These are not irreconcilable positions. The trouble is that most of, in much of our radical, liberal, progressive politics, we cannot see simultaneously two victims. There are two victims of one policy. And somehow we tend to pick one of them as real victim, the other as a non-real victim. So let's start from the beginning. What is Citizenship Amendment Act all about? We have had a Citizenship Act in this country, 1955. There have been minor amendments on the way. The Act, like everywhere else in the world, tells you that you can become citizen of India by four routes, either because you're born there, here, or because your spouse is from here, or because your parents are from here. These are standard routes that apply all over the world. And then the fourth route, which also applies all over the world, is called naturalization, which is to say, you don't belong to this country, you don't have a right in that sense, but you come from outside, you apply, the country considers your application, and you are granted a citizenship, not based on your birth, not based on any of those things, but whatever the country's policies at that time, any country reserves the right to prescribe a procedure through which you can be naturalized. So my friend, and now I can say proud Indian, Jean Dres, is an Indian citizen by virtue of that provision. He is a naturalized Indian citizen, born in Belgium, but someone who sought India's uh, citizenship and has now acquired it. All right? Under this provision, the government could have given citizenship to anyone who applies and has been granting it for the last 70 years. So, a Pakistani Hindu who crossed over to India, the government of India was always well within its rights to give them citizenship. They would ask for some proof, some procedures. And there was a slightly long procedure of about 12 years or so that you would take before you would be formally handed over the document. But you could be you know, given some citizenship rights, some, some initial residential rights to begin with. Now, that's been our standard citizenship act for the last 70 years. What is the problem in this act? There is a small problem. There is a big problem about India's citizenship. 
The small problem was that occasionally you would have some trickle-ins, for example, Pakistani Hindus. Now, there can be absolutely no doubt about the fact that Hindus and all minorities have been treated very unfairly in Pakistan. This cannot, I mean, you can't have a serious argument on this question. They've been very badly treated. Uh, they've been given a second-rate citizenship, and, uh, and many of them see coming to India as the only escape available to them. So there's a bit of trickle of that. There is similarly in uh, Sri Lanka, when the Sri Lankan regime was so oppressive, primarily based on ethnicity and language, that many Sri Lankan Tamils came to India, wanted India citizenship. So, but these are in quantitative terms, these are small things. Or there is the specific problem, issue of Tibetans from China who come to India. So these, this is what I call a small problem. These, this is an issue which waits for a clear policy. These people what apply to India to be, you know, come to India as refugees. These are not immigrants. These are refugees who come to India seeking refuge. The government of India has somewhat arbitrarily decided, because we don't have a refugee policy in the country. Now, that's a small and limited problem. The real big problem has been our border with what used to be East Pakistan and is now Bangladesh. Because it's an open and porous border, border has been an open and porous border for last 50, 60 years. Because earlier, economy was very unequal. Bangladesh was no longer, mind you, Bangladesh's GDP is higher than India currently. I mean, GDP growth rate is higher than India right now. But at some point, Bangladesh used to be exceedingly poor compared to India. So economic opportunities were very lopsided. And there was also discrimination against Hindus. Although we should not confuse Pakistan's discrimination against Hindus with Bangladesh's discrimination against Hindus. Because in Pakistan, most of the Hindus are Dalits. So they are doubly disadvantaged. In Bangladesh, for various historical reasons, Hindus tended to be landlords. So they were somewhat better off. The oppression in East Pakistan was not of that order. There has been massive migration. Uh, initially, in the pre-partition days, the migration from East, Bangla East Pakistan, or what was East Bengal those days, uh, East Bengal to Assam particularly, also to this part of uh, uh, Bengal, what is West Bengal now, there was a large-scale migration, but much significant proportion of migration in the pre-partition days was that of Bengali Muslims to what is now Assam. That was largely for economic reasons. There were areas which were under-cultivated. Bengali Muslims were very hardy peasants. They came, they cultivated especially the char areas, which were very hard to cultivate. They came in, they cultivated. Post-partition, there were more Hindus. Proportionately, there were more Hindus who came from, West, uh, from East Bengal, uh, East Pakistan to India. There's been a trickle of that. Now, that has gone in many directions. One in Tripura, and as Pradyut pointed out, within the last 100 years, Tripura's demography has changed completely. And if you go to Northeast, and I was very happy to hear, you know, your response to the, uh, to the question of the Northeast, the sensitivity that I can detect in this campus, which is so very unusual uh, in Indian campuses. Uh, I would simply endorse what he said, that it is one thing to have an abstract sympathy or abstract empathy but the best way to express that empathy is to understand the Northeast. Understand all these eight states. Understand all these eight states in their specificity. Now, if you travel in Northeast, one expression you hear very often is 
Tripurization. You know, what happened in Tripura is a nightmare for every other community of the Northeast. We don't want to become another Tripura. Everyone would tell you in the Northeast. This is a very real thing. Now, there are some states where, for reasons of a different kind, like Mizoram and Nagaland, reasons of insurgency in the past, not much immigration could take place. But in Meghalaya, parts of Meghalaya, Shillong and Iran, and in Tripura, and of course Assam, massive migration has taken place, which in some cases has changed the demographic balance altogether. Now the question we really need to understand and ask ourselves is, is this anxiety a legitimate anxiety? That's really what the entire debate hinges on. Is the anxiety of an SMEs that they could be turned into a minority in their own land? Is that a is that factually correct? And B, even if factually correct, is this something people should legitimately be worried about? I'm saying all this because uh, two days ago a very good article has appeared criticizing my position. Uh, this is in first post. Some uh, national law school students have written an article saying Mr. Yogen Jadav is contradictory. On the one hand, he says CAA is bad. On the other hand, he says Assam and NRC was justified. Uh, that is actually my position. Uh, and that article actually... Well, thank you. But the authors think this is an extreme example of hypocrisy and inconsistency. That, you know, and then I understand that. It's a very good article. Please do read if you find time. Uh, it, because it's, it doesn't factually misreport me. The trouble in our country is the moment we start critiquing someone, we start misreporting, misrepresenting, for Gali Galoch, and so on. I like that article because it doesn't misreport me. It says this is what Mr. Yadav believes in, and this is completely untenable position. The question we should be asking is, number one, is it that Assam has actually undergone a demographic shift? My submission, I'm no demographer. Uh, many of you would know this much better than I do. My submission is, on balance, certain parts of Assam have undergone, have, have had immigration of a level which has changed the demographic balance altogether. Within 10 years, from 1991 to 2001, the proportion of SMEs in Assam's population went down by 10%. That's huge. Second, all right, even if there is this demographic shift, shift, should you be worried about it? We are an open country. Everyone has a right to go. Fundamental rights are ensured. Every Indian can go wherever they want. Every Indian can reside wherever they want. So why be worried? I would want you to think carefully about it because I think for far too long we have practiced an abstract liberalism. It's, it's, it's a certain abstract cosmopolitanism. India is an open country, free for everyone, everyone should be allowed. This is correct. That's actually the spirit of India. But should do communities, I mean, number one, do we have something like communities? Do those communities have right to exist? Do those communities have legitimate anxieties? And should those anxieties be addressed? My submission, and not just for the Northeast, is that these are legitimate anxieties. We should not think of drastic solutions, but we must be very attentive to these things. I would say that in many contexts, some of which you may not like, but as I said, being truthful is better than being popular. Uh, the I know some of you may not like the, you know, uh, I, because I keep thinking about it. I've spent some time traveling to and uh, you're speaking to people in North Bengal. In North Bengal, there's a very large community called Rajbongshis. Now, Rajbongshis <coughs> are surrounded, so they are there around Jalpai Guri, Siliguri town, and so on. Travel around Siliguri, you would find every village has Rajbongshis. 
in the Siliguri town, you would find practically none. And they say, we've been colonized in our own home. They name communities which have come and prospered and so on and so forth. When Kannadiga speakers are worried about what's happening in Bangalore city, I don't quite agree with their prescriptions. You know, those who want, those are alarmed at Bangalore becoming a city where Kannadiga as a language, Kannada language actually almost has no special status at all. I understand their anxiety. I don't like their prescriptions and solutions. But that's an anxiety that needs to be understood. Or say in the Dang, Dang district of uh, Gujarat, when there is a conversion from Hindu Adivasis to Christians, in that small, tiny community, suddenly the demographic shift takes place. These are things which we social scientists should very closely notice, monitor, understand the anxiety and come up with reasonable solutions. My problem is that my secular liberal friends, when someone says in Kashmir, there is a plan of the government of India to settle people from outside, take them in Kashmir. Most of my secular liberal friends would say, oh, that is a disaster. And I completely agree with them. That's a disaster. But if that is a disaster, why is it that settling so many people in Tripura was not a disaster? <laughs> Our liberal cosmopolitanism needs to be grounded. We don't need to give up our liberalism. We don't need to give up our cosmopolitanism. But it needs to be grounded there. Now let me come back to that. I'm sorry it's turning into a bit of a classroom lecture. But I really wanted to, us to understand because my temptation is that if I've explained this crowd, then maybe I've reached about 50,000, maybe I've reached 1 lakh people. Because all of you, I hope, would share and write about it and talk to your friends about it and be influencers. So speaking to influencers is a serious business. So we have a small problem and we had a big problem. What is the solution? What should be our national policy on this issue? To me, the basic principle is something that Swami Vivekananda had articulated. I actually like his speech, some of the things that he said. When Swami Vivekananda gave that speech in Chicago, which so many Indians are so fond of and proud of, largely we like it because someone went to a global Olympic and got a gold medal. You know, that's how it's seen by most people. Swamiji went to a world parliament of religions and Swamiji gave that wonderful speech. But he actually said some very nice things. He says, I'm proud of being a Hindu because my religion is willing to accept the truth of every other religion. That's a beautiful thing to say about Hindus. Right or wrong, but this is a beautiful, you know, way. And he says about India, he says, I'm, being, I'm proud of being an Indian because this is a country which has offered shelter to anyone who wanted shelter. You know? So for me, the first principle of any policy of a refugee immigration policy should be, one, India, a large country, a democratic country, should be willing to offer refuge to those who are persecuted around India and who look to India for solutions. That's the first principle. But that's not the only principle. The trouble with our liberal friends is that they think this is the only principle. Second, is that this, because we are not Canada, because we are not US, our capacity to take people from outside is limited. As I say in Hindi, So there is a limit, you know, because, because of the nature of our population. If we were Canada, uh, we could take three times more our population, but we can't. So with genuinely persecuted communities, social groups, our doors should be open. That's what our civilization has been like. To my mind, what Swami Vivekananda said, 
was a civilizational value, which I think we should cherish. We should have a policy based on that. But that policy would be constrained by second principle, namely, there is a physical limit to how much you can take. More importantly, you cannot put the burden of your civilizational charity on one locality. This is what we need to do. That's really the tragedy of what happened in uh, Tripura. Because you say, all right, as a country, you can say, you know, let's be hospitable, let's invite people and so on and so forth, and let them all go to your room. You cannot say that the entire burden of my liberalism will be borne by you. It has to be spread. And this is the problem of what happened in the Northeast. Uh, that we said, I mean, I, I like the principle of saying that, okay, if there are persecuted people coming to India, they should be allowed in. But in which case you should have a policy. We did not have a policy. So this is the background. Now I will go quickly over the CAA business. So we have a small problem. We have a big problem. Is CAA the solution? It is no solution at all. It is not a solution to the first problem because all you needed to do for the first problem was to reduce the 12 year period to a five year period, do it for everyone. You always had the discretion of saying who you wanted to let in, who you did not want to let in. There was no problem. And to the second, the solution that has been worked out is a bigger problem than the solution. Basically, we've added to the problem. What is the solution? The solution is, all right, we have these many people who have come from Bangladesh. They are without papers. If they are Hindus, because I don't know many Sikhs migrating from Bangladesh to India. So it's a basically a Hindu-Muslim question. You are Bengali, you've come from Bangladesh. If you are Muslim, you are a foreigner. If you are Hindu, it's all right. The country belongs to you. What's the problem? So, notwithstanding whatever the, the, the CAA talks about, it basically amounts to a very simple, I mean, you can summarize the entire CAA in one sentence. CAA is a board which is put up on the borders of India, and the board says, no Muslims, please. That is the sum and substance of the CAA. And that's why it is wrong. My friend had actually listed most of the reasons why this is so patently discriminatory. To say that this five lies, I'll recount all the five lies. To say that this is, uh, you know, what the BJP leaders say on television and such like. You know, this is for religious minorities in the neighborhood. What's wrong if we give place to religious minorities? Now, the first thing that would occur to all of us is, BJP? So worried about minorities? <laughs> Baba Re, isn't that a good news? Suddenly their heart melts. Minorities, they go to. And BJP leaders say there was a Nehru Liaqat Pact which was about protecting minorities. And Pakistan has been very unfair to its minorities. Alright, so BJP is very worried about minorities. And what do they do then? Number one, on what basis do you select these three countries? Why not Nepal? Why not China? Why not Myanmar? Why not Sri Lanka? The official reasoning sometimes, not the official, the television reasoning is because these three countries have theocratic states. All right, have you read Sri Lanka's constitution? <laughs> Sri Lanka's constitution actually says promotion of Buddhism is the task of the state. This is official religion. Why doesn't it apply to Sri Lanka? That's one. Second, why is it that we are concerned only about religious persecution? There are other forms of persecution. There is a regional persecution. There is a linguistic persecution. There is sectarian persecution. Why not that? Third, 
even if you are interested in religious persecution, religious minorities who are persecuted only in these three countries, why not Ahmadiyya? Why not Hazaras? No basis. Fourth, as my friend Pradyut has pointed out, on what basis do you exempt four states in, the, in India? What is the rationale? No. Suddenly, BJP says it won't apply to Mizoram, won't apply to Nagaland, won't apply to Arunachal, etc. On what basis? Simply because it was politically inconvenient for you? Simply because the chief ministers of these states came and said, Baba, BJP ka politics nahi hoga, pe agar aisa karoge to. Suddenly you come out with an exception. What is the basis? And fifth, what is the basis for the deadline of December 2014? No basis. And you have all this loose talk that Pakistani cricketer was poor man, was very badly treated by his cricket. So if that Pakistani cricketer wants to apply tomorrow, he will not be allowed under CAA because he should have applied in December 2014. <laughs> so, I mean, for these five things, there is simply no answer. Why is the BJP then doing it? There are three tiers of reasons. Number one, BJP had hoped that Assam NRC could be tweaked in such a way that this net will catch only Muslims and all the Hindus will pass through. Sadly for them, it did not work out. So the net caught 19 lakh people. Of them, 13 lakh turned out to be Hindus and only 6 lakhs were Muslims. That's a problem for BJP because Bengali Hindus are BJP's vote bank in Assam. <laughs> BJP's entry in Assam politics was not through Ohamias. It is through Bengali Hindus. So suddenly, BJP's uh, vote bank is threatened. BJP wants to assure to its vote banks. Isi le kehte chronology samaj lo. Pehle CAA aayega. What is that chronology? Ke tum chinta mat karo. Hindu Bengali ho na apne aadmi ho. Tum chinta mat karo. Tumhe nikal dengi. That's one. Second, it is an attempt to basically win West Bengal election of 2021. Because... BJP is desperate to win 2021 elections in West Bengal. I really dread for the state of West Bengal right now. Remember, West Bengal was one of the most communally charged states in the history of India. 1940s of Bengal is one of the worst communal conflagration that you can see in Indian history. BJP knows that winning, doing well in Lok Sabha election is not enough. They are looking at a possible defeat in West Bengal. But what can work wonders for them is a Hindu-Muslim conflict. So create a Hindu-Muslim rift and win West Bengal. This is the crude formula that is being used. Now, you tell me, there are so many things about the Rashtwad. If someone is burning a country, he says, he is burning a fire in his house, and he says, the rice is very good. What is that? I would call it Desh Droh. This is sedition. This is the worst offense against you. Deliberately creating hatred between communities in order to suit your political intent. What can be worse than this? This is the politics. And the third intent is outside Assam and Bengal, you send a signal and the signal is clear Muslims are second-rate citizens of the country even if you do not take the citizenship of a single Muslim it still is a very clear signal to the Muslims you are second-rate citizens of the country this is what BJP wants to do for those who say achai se kya sirf notional hai how does it affect people right now? I would just remind all of us that in Germany, it began with just wearing a star. When Jews went out, they were made to wear a star. What's the problem with a star? What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Why are you making such a big issue on this? And you know, what began with just wearing a star ended up in Auschwitz. Hmm? So, 
this division that's being drawn and if it is accepted as a legally tenable distinction then all forms of discrimination can be mounted on this basically not to put too fine a point on it this is an attempt to distinguish between makan malik and kiraydar some communities are makan maliks of india others are tenants muslims as kiraydars in this country that's what it is all about finally the question that bjp would ask again and again but we are not taking away the citizenship of any indian muslim yes sir if you were passing only caa then you are not you are only telling them that they are kiraydars yes you are not throwing them out but with nrc and npr you are doing exactly what you say you are not doing because once nrc comes into operation in whichever way is applied either it is used by putting the onus on every citizen like it was done in assam every citizen had to give a proof or the other route which the npr will take which is to say you won't have to give the proof to begin with but anyone can object against you and once there is an objection against you then you have to give a proof and that the government will decide whether the proof is adequate or not which would mean you are students of social science there are large number of people in this country mostly poor nomadic communities all kinds of groups who cannot produce documents of any reasonable kind so they would remain undocumented they will find place in npr that